So it has happened. Our first actual bit of gameplay has released. And this is GameStar, by the way. GameStar, if you don't know, are a German company that tend to get the first scoops on every game like this. I remember when Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord came out and they got the first gameplay running up to the launch. As you know, Man Lords is coming out on the 27th of April. <laughs> God, let me just double check that. As you well know, Man Lords is coming out on the 26th of April of this year. Now, this release date in two weeks is very exciting since it's already had 2 million wish lists on Steam and it's growing every single day. In fact, I think Man Lords is perhaps one of the most wishlisted games that Steam has ever had, or at least it's in the top 10, which is insane. And for a game that definitely isn't like the day before, as in it's actually got real gameplay, that means it's got a lot to live up to because it is definitely coming. Rock, Paper, Shotgun have given it reviews. PC Gamer has given it reviews. And all in all, as you can probably tell, there's a lot of people waiting for this. But let's dive straight into some of this new gameplay that GameStar have showed us already. First of all, we get our first look at some of the actual battles, which is exciting because we haven't had a proper look at them yet. Most of the stuff we've just been getting is the city builder. Now, first of all, we can see from the initial demo that we played to now what the changes are. UI changes are pretty minimal. I think it looks a little bit more muted in GameStar's version, or should I say the full release? But I think a lot of that might just be down to the fact that this is a 1080p stream rather than the 4K footage that I recorded a couple of years ago of that demo. I think this version, or at least the full version here, looks a little bit more gritty and a bit muted in color. But there are a few different design choices as well. We can see at the top, some of the icons have changed from the demo to, well, now the full version. Some of them are a little bit clearer and a little bit less cartoony as well. But it just has this beautiful aesthetic, reminding me so much of a painted miniature board. Everything has its place and fits into the landscape so realistically. I think there's often a tendency for city builders to often start looking very player built, you know, like a city's skylines where they have square roads and everything looks like it's been placed down by, I guess, someone's playing a game, rather than actually a medieval village, which is what Manor seems to be going for. This looks way more realistic. It seems like this has dynamically grown throughout buildings and, of course, ages of generations, rather than a game sort of village. And that's what I really love about the aesthetic that they've gone for. But we cut straight to some of this battle gameplay that Manor Lords is here to show off. And this is where it gets really exciting. So first of all, pausing here, we get our first look and there is a ton of stuff to pay attention to. First of all, this UI doesn't really change, indicating that these battles, these invasions and what look to be bandits are more natural implementations. Rather than going from a city building portion to a loading screen, then into battles, it looks like these are just things that dynamically happen. Bandits turn up and you've got to muster men together in order to stop them because we've got all the same UI at the top well, being all our resources, our food, so on and so forth. Nothing comes to a halt just because some people decided they don't like you. And you can kind of get the look of that because, I mean, you've got the poor lamb Beatrice here. Oh, Beatrix. Who is a lamb in waiting and I'm sure is going to become a lamb chop very soon because there's definitely some enemies on their way. But first of all, we've got some units here at the bottom. We've got our unit cards. We've got a unit of archers who are firing. We can see that they are in attack stance, which is a nice little touch. And I'm assuming what this means here means it fire at will. Whatever the arrows with a guy in, on the knees, I don't know if I want to know what that is. But we've all got our different stances and our different attack modes that all of our units can have. We've got spearmen, we've got clubmen. They can all be in attack mode, defensive mode. I'm assuming more of a balance mode. And this is probably some sort of shield wall and a movement mode or stand your ground, that kind of thing. Whether you want them waiting or whether you want them halting. Now, of course, most of this is speculation so far, but that's what will make the most sense in controlling our troops. Very much like Total War. But they have stated that this is kind of going to be your average size of battle, rather than the huge stuff that we saw in Total War games, or even some of the trailers. They can grow since some of the trailers that we have seen for Man Lords have been bigger battles, but most of them, I think, are the majority are going to look like this, especially in your early game. I really do love the unit cards. They're very Total War-esque, or at least Rome Total War. Not necessarily because of the artwork. I guess that's more Thrones of Britannia style. But the little icons here that switch between whether in battle, whether they're running, and you, you can see what the status is of each of these troops. I'm assuming this is how we muster more troops, adding in units, of course, to our roster to send them into battle. Because, of course, this is not like picking unit cards. These are all villagers that have just picked up spears, picked up bows. You can train them in certain areas, as we'll get onto in a little bit. And actually, if we skip forward a little bit, we can see our movement of our troops. It's very slick. It's very smooth. 
And yeah, we can see the actual bandits just turn up one day. They decide that they've had enough and they're coming to attack us. Later on in this video, it starts to get dark. There's burning. Of course, the bandits are coming to take down most of our resources. And of course, we're fighting within the village themselves. Now, we can have more troops here. There's way more. We can see the archers, their ammunition, stamina. Morale will be a thing as well. Everybody will have the chance to run away. And we can see that there when they hover it over. This is how much morale they've got left. This is our stamina. And of course, this is the status, a balanced mode, walking and shooting as well. This is our archer militia. And I think, yes, this is the player rather than some bandits, hence the banner on both sides there. It's a lovely little look at what we're going to be getting with the combat, something that hasn't been shown yet. And to see some real gameplay with this, I think is a real positive because it's all well and good saying that it's coming, that there will be these battles. But until we see them, I think it's kind of up in the air to see how successful they are. Because once again, there is a focus on the city building. And going into that, we do get to see a little bit more. We can see the building plots when you're putting down houses and areas is very similar to what we got within the demo. You can increase the amount of plot divisions when building in an area. A beautiful touch. And I've not really seen this before in a city builder. Not only can you determine how big you want these burgage plots, or I guess houses, but you can divide them into different sections. Maybe you want fewer plots, but bigger houses. That means you can fit more things and more resources within these plots. For example, bigger farms, bigger pens for goats, livestock, that sort of thing. Or you want to split it into more but smaller plots so you can have a more focus on a population rather than the resource collection. And these are some really, really nice touches. Of course, that famous road building is coming back, blended perfectly within this world as well. And I did actually talk to Slavic Magic. There was a lot of speculation whether there will be dynamic road formation. Something a game like Ostriv has, where the roads and paths are built depending on where your villagers walk. If they need to get to a resource collection point, they will walk in that area. And as time goes on, some paths will start to erode within the land. Now, that was actually taken out of Man Laws just because it didn't quite work, especially with the scale they're going for. But I don't think it's necessary because of the amount of detail that we've already got within these plots. Speaking of plots, how have they been upgraded since the demo? Well, if we pause on this certain area, there's a whole lot more to get our teeth into. We saw this in the demo, being able to put down carrot plots here, chicken coops, and even goat sheds. This means that when we put down a house, someone moves in, depending on the size of plots, means that we can put some little extras there. Maybe they want a little garden so they can grow their own carrots or have some livestock within it. This means that they don't have to solely rely on the pool of wheat or food that's within the village market. Because of course, you're gonna have your big farms that people are harvesting at certain times of the year, but people can have their own little resource pools as well that they can pull from. And this is a really, really nice touch. But we can see a little bit more. As they sort of start to hover over it, we have a look at the armor's workshop. This enables the production of helmets. After unlocking advanced armor making and master armor making, which is in the development screen we'll get onto in a little bit, it enables the production of male armor and plate armor. It converts all the residents within this plot to artisans, locking them from being assigned to other jobs. So as you go through assignment, telling people what jobs you want them to do, these guys aren't a part of that assignment because their house is now an armor's workshop and they can do that. Now this comes up a little bit later as well, with a few more indicators of what you can do. If we go back into our construction and you can see there's a Fletcher's workshop that can be made. This means that now all these residents make war bows. Of course, you can have shoemakers as well. I'm assuming these are sewers for repairing clothes and more construction workers for building things like, I don't know, carts, so on and so forth. The backyard extension for crops will probably be your most used ones though, because that's gonna add to your food pool at said top. Now let's have a little bit of a look at the development trees, because this is something that we haven't seen too much into once again. Now the development trees are just your general upgrading, whether you go from certain tech to researching things like armor, and of course weapons for later on in the game. You start with your basics of having your villages that can all do collecting wood, making firewood, hunting, that sort of thing. But what happens when you start to advance if you want better houses that mean that you're much more resistant to fire from bandits or you want better weapons when you start going to war? Well, you have to do that through these development trees. And if we skip forward in the video, we get a little look at that again. So we can click in on the city here and we have our foreign suppliers. This means we can get a new building, which is a firewood cart, and a new building, which is a food cart. Now we have everything here from our livestock and our food portions 
to our trading. We also have things like resource collecting and the natural world, things like hunting with pelts, and of course, making uh, healing potions, and of course, beekeeping, which it looks like over here. And then we have our armory here and resource collection, such as mining. Now, there is a lot of stuff here, and I think these resource trees are going to be pretty big. They reveal themselves as you go on, and new branches are unlocked. They can then be paired with policies. Wild animals on rich deposits breed twice as fast at the cost of 50% reduced yields from crops. So this is if you have a resource area that is really rich in some of these hunting grounds. Maybe there's a lot of deer around, but there's not a lot of fertile land. This is probably the policy you go for. And this is how you change the game. It is not just your regular city builder that goes through the motions. It means that each time you play is going to be completely different. Then we get to look at the regions. And this is diplomacy. We can claim regions. You don't just automatically get them if you want them. That's not how it would have worked in the medieval world. You need influence, which are these fists here. Now, if we go back to one of our other slots here, we can see the fists at the top. That's how much influence that we have. And actually, that was part of the demo itself. So skipping back forward, when we go and have a look at the influence, that's how it's going to affect whether you gain the regions that you put a claim in for. You can see each resource that the region has, whether it's, of course, hunting grounds, berries, good stuff for clay and pottery, mining facilities, and of course, more quarry areas. You can see if there's bandits in the area as well. And if you need to, you can trade between whether you want to import, export or do a full trade, whether you're doing like for like as well. This can be anything from livestock to resources and, of course, armor and weapons. Now, all of this comes within a full complex diplomacy system, one that we haven't had too much information about. There is supposedly an overall lord or king that will decide whether each person gets a region. And these are all AI that have their own influence that can, of course, trade with you and can attack you if they're not particularly happy with you. It is all about vying for these different regions and within these regions, the resources that come with them. This is fully about building up your village, building up your cities, and then defending them from the likes of brigands and other lords that want to take them from you. There is so much to delve into here, and I can't wait to have a look at more. Of course, taxing is going to be a part of it, whether it's trading taxing or land tax. Churches are going to be a big area, and I'm not quite sure how religion is going to be implemented within the game thus far, but it will be definitely a factor. Making money is going to be one of your sole purposes in order to grow and to get bigger populations and for people to come and join you. But you have to be careful and balance it. Just like you have to balance what workers you put in different areas, you're also going to have to balance how much you tax them, how many resources that you disperse within your people, or of course, depending on their class, your focus between economy or going to war. Because these wars aren't going to be like any other game. They're going to directly impact your village. If you have a lot of people that want to head off to war or you're being attacked, you train as many guys to be spearmen, swordsmen, archers as possible, and you lose them, that's going to directly impact the people that can work on the farms, in the mines, that can make your weapons in the future, and that's going to send you on a downhill slope. So that's something that has to be paid attention to as well. There is so much in Man Laws, and there is a lot of intricate details, and I cannot wait to delve into it more. And this month is going to be a full run-up, so make sure you stick around the channel if you haven't already. By the way, it helps infinitely if you subscribe, not just because you'll get all the latest info and everything that's coming out of this new RTS game, but I also incredibly appreciate it. So if you have a second, please click that below. But until then, guys, I will see you in the next video about Manor Lords.